Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on August 31st, last day of the month. It's a Thursday. We're here at First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we're going to read our daily lectionary texts for today, talk about it a little bit. And I don't know, I think last time we did this, and I think we went 41 minutes or something. And I think that's a little bit too long, but uh, maybe we won't go as long today, we'll right? But we'll, we'll, see, we'll see where we go. Um, I think we're always excited to see what the Holy Spirit might reveal to us. And it's not like we are generating massive amounts of awesome insights. I think sometimes just listening to the Lord and, and uh, reading his word and seeing where we go with it. So let me open us in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, uh, thank you for this opportunity that you give us to read your word. I pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be open and that our lives would be transformed just this next step, Lord, along the way of our sanctification as we are being made more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. We're going to start today with Psalm 143. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications in your faithfulness. Answer me in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued me, crushing my life to the ground, making me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore my spirit faints within me, my heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old, I think about all your deeds, I meditate on the works of your hands, I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I shall be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear of your steadfast love in the morning, for in you I put my trust. Teach me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Save me, O Lord, from my enemies. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on a level path. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your steadfast love, cut off my enemies and destroy all my adversaries, for I am your servant. And from Psalm 147, verses 12 through 20. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He grants peace within your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down hail like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his ordinances. Praise the Lord. Our Hebrew scripture reading today comes from 1 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 16 and going through the end of the chapter. Later, Two women who were prostitutes came to the king, and this is King Solomon, and stood before him. The one woman said, Please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house. Only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, clearly it was not the son I had born. But the other woman said, No, the living son is mine, and the dead son is yours. The first said, No, the dead son is yours, and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then the king said, The one says, This is my son that is alive, and your son is dead, while the other says, Not so, your son is dead, while, and my son is the living one. So the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. 
The king said, Divide the living boy in two, then give half to the one and half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, Because compassion for her son burned within her, Please, my lord, give her the living boy. Certainly do not kill him. The other said, It shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide it. Then the king responded, Give the first woman the living boy. Do not kill him. She is his mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king, because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. And from Acts chapter 27, verses 27 through 44. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were drifting across the sea of Adria, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took soundings and found twenty fathoms. A little further on, they took soundings again and found fifteen fathoms. Fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. But when the sailors tried to escape from the ship and had lowered the boat into the sea on the pretext of putting out anchors from the boat, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the boat and set it adrift. Just before daybreak, Paul urged all of them to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been in suspense and remaining without food, having eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will help you survive, for none of you will lose a hair from your heads. After he had said this, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then all of them were encouraged and took food for themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. After they had satisfied their hunger, they lightened the ship by throwing the wheat into the sea. In the morning, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore if they could. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, they loosened the ropes and tied the steering oars then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the ship aground, and bow struck and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners so that none might swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land and the rest to follow, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to the land. Our gospel lesson today comes from Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 12. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city, and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
And back to our Psalms, Psalm 81. Sing aloud to God our strength, shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our festal day. For it is a statute for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a voice I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called, and I rescued you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you in the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, will I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Then I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him, and their doom would last forever. I would feed you with the finest of wheat, and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. And our final psalm today is Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Okay, I think I want to do something a little bit different today. Okay. And I wanted to look at the Acts passage and how that connects actually to those last two Psalms that we read, Psalm 81 okay. and Psalm 116. Um, so here we have... Paul, um, having been arrested, falsely accused mm -hmm. uh, on all of the uh, back and forth between the different provincial governors and this and the other thing. Now he's appealed to Caesar. He's on his way. They're on a boat. Paul had warned them, hey, it's not time to sail. We should, we should winter here. But they get in the boat anyway because... Right. You know, people are people, and they want to make their money, and they want to do their thing. They want to go on their way, and they've been in the midst of a storm for days and days and days. And finally, they find some land. They crash onto the beach, but everybody stays. But before they crash on the beach, Paul tells them that he has a vision from the Lord that everybody will be saved as long as they all stay in the boat. Eat some food. He breaks bread. We read in the Mark passage, you know, the... Uh, the initiation of the Lord's Supper. He breaks bread, to those same kind of words, and everybody makes it there alive. Um, but I'm just struck by how Psalm 116 could really be a prayer that Paul could have been praying while he is on that mm -hmm. boat. All those things about uh, you know, the snares of death. Everyone around me is a liar because all of the accusations that were being made against Paul were... 
uh, were false. They were made up. Um, and even the deliverance from death. I know that Paul has suffered a lot on all of his missionary journeys, so it's not like he's unaccustomed to being threatened. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I don't think any of this is pleasant for Paul. It's right. like he's... I mean, unjustly accused, he's falsely imprisoned, he's in the midst of a storm that he warned them against, and yet here he finds himself surrounded by all these people, and he continues to care for them mm -hmm. and, and remains obedient to, uh, to God. And so um, I just find that fascinating how, you know, reading through especially this 116 could really be that combination prayer, you know, oh Lord, save my life, and not this isn't even all my fault. Right. But here I am, but I'm at your mercy. And and that's and that's okay. And I wonder if, you know, maybe sometimes we feel the same way. It's like, you know, the circumstances are beyond our control. Right. We didn't ask for the problems that we face. Um, and we even tried to avoid them, yet here they are. How can we remain faithful in the midst of it? Right, and trusting when surely it has to be difficult. I mean, how can how can this be used for good? And and he is a prisoner, and the, the they're talking about killing everyone because they don't want the prisoners to escape because they right. don't want it to come back on them. And of course, the centurion steps in, but like they want me dead. They don't listen to me. They want me dead. He's still proclaiming. He's still being faithful. How could there not be some? degree of doubt and right. because like you said he is truly he is at God's mercy he is at right. humans mercy which he's got faith in God right. obviously it's a little difficult to have faith in humanity sometimes it is very <laughs> and, difficult to have faith in humanity he is at their mercy as yeah. well and so there are so many things but I guess you know I, I said this the other day in a conversation you and I had he is controlling the only thing he can control, and that is him. Mm -hmm. And his, you know, the way he's responding is in faithfulness and is in obedience, and that is the one thing he can control. Right, right. So. And so I really think that that just how one sixteen jumped out at me for mm -hmm. that, and then even the Psalm eighty one, and this is where it does link back to the gospel passage, where in Mark, you know, we we see Mark's. Um, uh, telling of the story of the, the Passover meal and how um, we frequently forget, we who are not of Jewish descent, that the Passover meal was the annual celebration of the freedom from slavery in Egypt. Right. All of the stuff, if you want to go back and read it in, in Exodus, you'll find that um, that whole situation, they're, they're slaves, God has promised to set them free. They're still in bondage. All of the plagues that come upon uh, Egypt, all of the ways that even Pharaoh increased the burdens and the tasks upon the slaves, the Hebrew slaves, as they were waiting for God's full deliverance, all of the complaints against Moses about why did you come and mess things up? It's bad enough being a slave, but now you've made us odious to the Egyptians. All these things, all these stories. And God finally does come, and the angel of death uh, appears and strikes down the firstborn of every everything household, in the land, every, every household, cattle, every everything. high and low, everything, um, except passed over the, the ones has. that had the blood of the sacrifice on the on the door. Um, and so this this Psalm eighty one though it's fascinating to me because it is a uh, it's the people of God, even after they are freed from slavery, and this is kind of some of their wilderness journey mm -hmm. story stuff. They've been they've been set free from Egypt, but they they continue to grumble, they continue to complain, they don't listen to God, they they turn against one another, and all the stuff that goes on. And I just kind of think, oh, well, now Jesus comes. He is celebrating the Passover. He's reminding them of their history, and their history is not always good. Right. You know, they're not always obedient. They they go through their good times and their bad times, and Jesus says, "This is my body. Mm -hmm. This is my blood," and changes the Passover understanding to focus on Him 
as the only one that can really make all of this right. right. So I just, I, I really, um, I just, I don't know, I saw a greater connection between these songs than I have in a while. Not right. that the, the songs are right. always good, but I just kind of love this connection that I saw today. But. Right, and, and in that Mark passage, you know, you, you said that about, you know, Jesus comes and he changes what the Passover is. It's no longer the sacrifice of the animals or the painting the doorpost. It is, it is him as the sacrifice. And he's reminding them, though, of their history. But in that reminder of history, I think what's important is that um, it's a reminder that God is faithful to who he Amen. says he is Amen. as well because he is constant through all of that. It doesn't right. matter where they're at. He is still constant, right. um, and his goodness is constant. Um, and so I think that that is a reminder of that part mm -hmm. of the story as well. Absolutely. Um, hmm. So did you want to touch on uh, Solomon and the, <laughs> and, the, and the women that have the... Uh, you know, I, I remember, the, I, I think I remember it maybe the first time I heard this story, obviously, as a child, and... Um, and I, I think about, oh yes, you know, Solomon, he's so wise and all these things, but why did this wisdom have to be applied to this situation and just the tragedy of, um, you know, a child yes. dying, there's the tragedy of loss and and it's the, the complicated relationship. It's, you know, it's two women who are prostitutes, but they're the only ones in the house that there's a, there's a brokenness and a loneliness that, that precedes this story. And, um, and I think about, okay, so Solomon rendered judgment about, well, to whom does the living child belong? And, and that's great, but I, I am increasingly even with this, a little unsatisfied. Um, unsatisfied because I think that injustice still persists. As wise as Solomon is, and as great as the saving of the life and giving it to the proper mother is, um, there's it doesn't, still a sadness. There's still a sadness there. The, the women are still apparently prostitutes. The women are still apparently alone. And it doesn't go on to say, and Solomon created a, a great works program and, and got them off of the streets and got them into a halfway house or whatever it might happen to be. It's just, well, the baby belongs to you. But, mm. but the, their circumstance stays the same. And I don't know if I'd ever really thought about that before until recently and I think about um, as good as Solomon can be we know that he was not able to solve all of the problems right. and in the as king over all of Israel he's responsible for the whole community and yet his own powers are, are limited right. um, and so it makes me think about today how do we do justice you know it's like well everyone marveled and they and they've, he's got the wisdom of God and he's supposed to execute justice. And I think, well, I don't, you know, I don't have Solomon's wisdom right. and I don't have his authority and I don't have his power, but even he was unable to make everything right. And I think, well, how, how, how can we, how do we do better? And I know that we work hard and I know we try. Um, but I think, again, there is our need for and continued dependence on God to be the one who is going to ultimately do the work that needs to be done. How can we be available, open, looking, participating in what God is doing, um, but just ultimately trusting that he is the true king. From him, all wisdom comes, and he actually does have the power to make all things right. And so in the messiness and the brokenness of community mm -hmm. where we can celebrate amazing joys but still lament amazing uh, tragedies. And grief. And grief. And heartbreak. And heartbreak. Um, and recognizing that our power is limited but how do we walk alongside people in the midst of that brokenness? Right. I don't know. That's well, what I I've think, been thinking a lot lately. I think we open our eyes to see those things around us and um, 
and recognizing our own limited abilities um, and knowing that, um, you know, it, all things are not set to right. We're not to that point yet. Mm -hmm. um, but there is hope. We do have hope in Christ and there is um, God's timing and that's with the Mark and the Acts passage, that's what, you know, you, you look at those two particular passages and, and in the Mark passage, it's, yes, it's the remembrance of the Passover, but even that, he says, you know, I will be betrayed by one of the 12 and, and Judas is sitting there and, and they're all I'm sh you know, appalled, like, that's not gonna happen. But it had to happen mm -hmm. and it does happen and, and as awful as it is, there is good that comes out of it. There is new life and resurrection. And then in the Acts passage um, with Paul, um, it's so overwhelming and it's scary and it's uncertain and it's uh, they don't know what's going to happen. And, and yet in God's timing, through that faithfulness and obedience, he does deliver them. Right. And so I think, you know, what I said earlier about Paul, you know, he controlled the only thing he could control. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we, that's not an acceptable answer for us. We don't want to control the things we can't control. We mm -hmm. want to control it all. Mm -hmm. We want to control it all. But we are limited in that capacity and mm -hmm. that ability. And, um, and that's difficult. That is difficult because we want to fix things. We want to make things right. Um, but the reality is that we don't have that. We don't have that. But in Christ, we have hope. Amen. And um, and we we care for and, and we love those around us, um, even in the injustice and the disappointments and the heartbreak and all the things. And all the things. All the things. Um, yeah. The first the first Psalm Psalm one forty. Thank thank you for sharing that. By the way, it was good good insight. I appreciate Thanks. that. Um, the Psalm 143, you know, it, it is a Psalm of David, and, and I'm just gonna reread those first two stanzas. Um, you know, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications in your faithfulness. Answer me in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued me, crushing my life to the ground, making me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore, my spirit faints within me, my heart within me is appalled. And I think that's a lot of our struggle. Yeah. And then what is David's response though? I remember the days of old. I think about all your deeds. I meditate on the works of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. And I think the solution that David has, again, in the midst of his most greatest need is to remember that which God has already done to reflect upon those things to to remember them and you know Jesus is is doing a new thing but the new thing he's doing is reminding them of all of the good things he has already done and pointing them forward to a, a complete consummation of all all things being set to right all injustices being uh, being removed all wickedness being judged all uh, the righteous finally being vindicated and and but even here um, David David knows that he only has one place to go and that's to the God who has already done good things and promises to continue to do better things in the future um, okay maybe we should wrap it up so we don't go 41 good. more minutes even though we can probably <laughs> talk a little bit longer and we do enjoy doing so but um, yeah do you want to do you have anything else to add you no did? no I think I'm Good. Okay. I think I'm good. All, All right. right. Yes. All right. Gracious Father, thank you for your words to us today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your goodness and your steadfastness. And I pray that we reach out to you and that we recognize that you are the ultimate power. You are the ultimate authority. And in difficult times and in those heartbreaking times we can turn to you and you are good you are good and you are gracious give us rest 
And in Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to the next time we do this together. Have a good day. Bye-bye.